The last time I spoke here in London was uh, 15th of March 2020 uh, at Thinkbox. Um, the next day, I went into lockdown. I think it's fair to say that one or two things have happened since then. Um, <clears throat> let's think about some of the key factors that have been buffeting the world since that time. COVID. The official death toll is 6 million worldwide, um, but modelling suggests the true number of incremental deaths is about 22 million. That's more than the First World War. That's more than any war since the Second World War. Um, it's the biggest pandemic that's hit since the Spanish flu of, two, of 1918. In response to that, the biggest global clock quarantine effort ever in human history, which, amongst other things, caused huge disruptions to global supply chains, which affected markets in many different ways, and that's still ongoing. Parts of China are still locked down. The way we work, the way we travel, the way we consume goods and services, the way we consume media, all those things have changed. And yes, there has been some hyperbole about that, but it looks like many of those changes are lasting. Working from home, hybrid working, is not going away. It's accelerated the digital transformation in, in the way we live our lives by about five to 10 years, all in the, in the space of a couple of years. We had the biggest wave of redundancies since the global financial crisis, and an incredible contraction of the economy. The sharpest contraction in the UK economy for over 600 years. The last time anything like that happened was around about the time of the English Civil War. Um, but in response to that, an incredible government response all around the world. The lowest interest rates for over 300 years. The biggest increase in government spending since the Second World War resulting in the fastest recovery for over 200 years. The other part of that, as well as the economic stimulus, the fastest vaccine rollout in history, which saved over 20 million lives in the first year alone. But the flip side of that is we have an ongoing health crisis. Um, NHS queues are at record levels, and not many commentators have observed this, but if you look at the employment data, there are record numbers of people who are still off sick, either with long COVID or the backlog of operations that have had to be postponed over the last couple of years. That affects the labour markets, which in turn affects the economy. Another thing that hasn't been uh, commented on so much, the biggest increase in savings since the 1960s. A lot of people actually found themselves better off because of working from home, lower costs, the government stimulus and so on. But some people are actually much worse off. So this big increase in inequality. Um, an incredibly fast recovery, record levels of hiring now, but a contraction of the labour force at the same time. A lot of people are sick, a lot of people have dropped out, a lot of people have retired early. Um, and that's pushing up wages. We've got a labour shortage. The first European war for over 30 years, um, the biggest energy shock since the 1970s, the biggest jumps in inflation for over 40 years, and in response to that, the biggest rise in interest rates for over 30 years. That's what happens if I leave you alone for five minutes. <laughs> OK, so the current crisis that we're facing is equally challenging. Um, Two things that, that brands need to think about right now. The first is inflation. Um, we're in a situation where demand in the economy is actually really quite healthy at the moment. But supply, for various reasons, ongoing disruptions to global supply chains, shortages in the labour market, supply is tight. And when demand is greater than supply, prices go up. Forecast for inflation is 9% for this year, for the UK. Now, for those of you, most of you I, I observe are quite young, um, so this is obviously very frightening and un, un, unprecedented to you. You can see from that chart, what, you know, it's, it, 
We haven't seen rates of inflation like that for a long time. I'm old, so I know what inflation can look like. This is UK inflation since 1800. Um, we know that it can get very much higher than this. Um, Spanish flu, the last big pandemic, it got up to 25%. Second World War, the biggest crisis, that, the most comparable crisis to what we've been through, it got up to 17%. 1970s, the last time we had an energy shock, it got up to 24%. Um, and actually, if you look around the world at other countries, it can get a lot higher, 80% or 79% in Turkey and Argentina. Inflation can get very scary indeed. And so <clears throat> the Bank of England and central banks around the world are reacting by tightening interest rates to, to, to nip this in the bud. And that may result in recession. We don't know where things are going to go, but we have to at least prepare for it. We're not in recession now. Um, if you look at GDP growth, you can see GDP growth, GDP fell by 9% during the pandemic, but rebounded at nearly 8% uh, in 2021. Compare that as the normal rate of growth is about 2.5%. Where are we now? Well, this year is actually still above trend at about 3.6%. This is a good year. Um, next year is forecast probably to still be growing over ac across the year, although we may get a couple of quarters of negative growth, which is a technical recession. But there's huge uncertainty about this. Um, we don't know whether we're going to be facing inflation, runaway inflation, a deep recession, stagflation, whatever. So you need to be prepared for all these things. But the primary thing right now is to focus on inflation. Focus on your pricing. So this is my first tip for how to think about these turbulent times. You have to get your pricing right. We have this tendency to talk about marketing as if marketing means communications and advertising. Marketing means using all four Ps. Product, price, place, and then last, promotion, i.e. marketing communications. And price is the crucial one right now. Price is about matching demand and supply. So to think about how you tweak your pricing in the current situation, think about demand and supply in your sector. Think about it like this as a grid. Is your demand in your sector falling or rising? Is supply tight or loose? Are prices in your sector rising or falling? Are costs in your sector rising or falling? That grid gives you a little bit of a, a steer on what you should be doing with price and volume. Let's think about how it played out during COVID. Top left, you've got, for example, suppose you're Pret-a-Manger or Costa Coffee. Demand was falling during lockdown. Supply was tightening because uh, nobody wanted to go out and work as a barista in the middle of a pandemic. So demand and supply tightening together, and so the correct response is to downsize. Um, suppose you're a semi semiconductor manufacturer. Very different. During COVID, lots of people were buying laptops because they're working at home, getting into gaming, so they wanted higher spec laptops. There was also the big crypto boom. So demand for, for semiconductors was rising, but supply was tight. So semiconductors put up their prices. That's the right response in that situation. So we saw a big rise in semiconductor prices. Now look at what happened after COVID. Um, people have bought their laptops during, during the, the, the first wave um, of lockdown. Um, they didn't need to buy another laptop. Um, meanwhile, the semiconductor manufacturers had invested in new facilities. So you had loose supply and falling demand. And so right now what we're seeing is semiconductor prices are in free fall. Um, prices are going down. And this is an important point. We are in inflationary times, but not in every sector. There are many sectors, actually, where we are seeing prices coming down at the moment. And then bottom right, um, rising demand and loose supply. That could be, for example, Zoom um, or any other provider of digital services where supply is effectively infinite. 
There, the strategy is to go for growth. So think about where you sit on that grid. And as we move from inflation into possibly recession, think about how those variables play out and what you need to do with your price and your volume. The second thing you need to do is to think about your price elasticity. As you move your price up and down, how will volume respond? You need to know that number. You need to know the shape of the sales versus price, uh, the sales versus price curve in order to know how to optimize your price, pricing and how to maximize your profit. And I would strongly recommend that you use econometric modeling to help you there. Um, we have got out of the habit, I think, of using econometrics to optimize price, because price has been static for so many brands for so long. Um, but we forget that econometric models not only can measure price elasticity, they must measure price elasticity in order to get all the other stuff right. That means that if you've got a, an econometric model or market mix model, as some people like to call it, I don't like that term, um, if you've got a model, it will tell you stuff about pricing, which is immensely valuable in financial terms. OK, so understand your price elasticity, optimize your pricing. And the first thing to think about when you're thinking about tweaking your pricing is your price promotions. Price promotions, on the face of it, appear to be an incredibly powerful tool for stimulating sales. When you run a price promotion, you'll see an, a, lip, uh, a spike in sales, and most of the extra volume appears to come from promotions. Um, unfortunately, that's an illusion. When you do econometric modeling, econometrics can show you what the true incremental volume from price promotions is. And what you find is that a big chunk of your promoted sales are actually just subsidizing existing sales. You're giving away discounts to people who would have bought you already. Another chunk of your sales are just time shifted. You're bringing sales forward. You're, you're getting extra sales this week at the expense of next week. Another chunk of your promotional sales are relocated. You run a promotion in Sainsbury's, you're cannibalizing your sales in Tesco's. You run a, sale, a promotion online, you cannibalize your bricks and mortar sales. Only a tiny proportion of promotional sales are incremental. Um, and that means that most promotions, most prom price promotions in most industries reduce profits. Nielsen reckoned about 84% of price promotions are unprofitable. Um, and if you keep doing it, you increase your price sensitivity, reduce your pricing power, and erode your margins. Price promotions are a drug. They're the crack cocaine of marketing. Um, I hope that we see an end to the senseless promotions that we've seen. Last Christmas was um, particularly a bad example where we had the, 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 the delivery firms, the Getter and Gorillas and so on, just giving away um, sales in order to buy customers that they wouldn't keep. Madness. Um, and excessive discounting is usually a bad idea at any time. It's a particularly bad idea at a time like this when prices are rising. Um, tweaking your promotions is a really easy way to adjust your pricing. And it can be immensely profitable. Um, a few years back, I worked with a brand that found itself with supply problems. I recommended they cut their price promotions. Their, pri their profits went up by 20% 20 20 overnight. So get that stuff right and then optimize your advertising investment. Advertising, as we keep saying, is an investment, not a cost, so treat it like one. Treat your advertising like any other financial investment, and that means thinking about shareholder value. Shareholder value is a term which is, I think, not widely understood enough. It's usually meant, thought to mean something like short-term profitability. There is, a, there is a mathematical theory of shareholder value which tells you how to trade off, if you like, the long and the short of it. Short-term investment, long-term flow of incremental profits. The formula, which I won't give you the mathematical formula, but it basically it's about m maximizing the net present value of that stream of profits using discounted cash flow analysis minus the amount, the amount you invest now. 
You need to understand how to do that calculation and you need to apply that to your advertising and marketing communications. Um, and where you optimise the, the level of investment depends on five factors. Your profit margins, your growth prospects, your investment costs, the cost of capital and investment in efficiency. And I'm going to talk about each of those five in turn. One, profit margins. If you don't make money, if you haven't got a decent margin, none of your marketing can be worthwhile. So you've got to get your margins right, and that means optimising your pricing. Optimise your pricing, optimise your promotions, get your margins to the right level, and then you can start to think about advertising investment. And as I say, excessive promotions is a recipe for disaster. But brand advertising can help to support firmer pricing and fatter margins. We know that the stronger the brand, the lower the price elasticity, the greater the pricing power, the more margin you can make. And new research from Kantar shows that emotional brand perceptions are a key factor for pricing power. This is research that Kantar have done with Oxford University at the Syed B Business School. And basically it shows that firms that invest in their brands have fatter margins and actually outperform the stock market. Secondly, think about growth prospects in your sector. Like I said during COVID, there were winners and losers. And Grace did a great analysis yesterday. Yes, hello, Grace. Um, uh, looking at the winners and losers in different sectors. In the, the year coming up, there will be winners and losers. Let's look at what happened during COVID. Um, first of all, if you think about consumption volume, you can sort of divide it into temporary cuts, lasting increases, lasting cuts, and temporary increases. Um, during lockdown, a whole load of things were cut back on for a while. Stuff to do with cars, restaurants, hotels. People weren't going out. They weren't buying so much, spend so much on clothes and jewellery and so on, because they weren't going out. But there were also lasting increases. There were winners. Um, Grace talked about, uh, I can't remember what the phrase you used was, but the, but the sort of, there were the victim sectors and the, uh, and the beneficiaries. Um, basically, stuff to do with home. Cooking and e uh, eating and drinking at home, home improvements, pets, gardens, flowers, um, all sorts of stuff to do with home-centred life because of this great shift to the home which has happened and which is not going away. Also, self-improvement, um, health, bicycles, exercise bikes, education. Lots of people started taking up new skills. Technology, laptops, um, and a great shift towards online shopping and local shopping. Correspondingly, lasting cuts. Stuff to do with commuting. Business travel collapsed and it hasn't recovered. Commuting collapsed and it hasn't fully recovered. Um, and a whole load of stuff to do with that. Most interesting one there, I think, is narcotics and prostitution, which seem to have... I think that shows that the, the drive for self-improvement has, in fact, had some lasting effects. Um, or another way of putting it, that's what happens if men have to stay at home. Um, temporary increases. OK, so two factors, two sectors saw temporary increases during COVID. Um, not the most obvious one, fish and musical instruments. Um, during lockdown, people started cooking fish at home because they couldn't go to restaurants, but the minute the, the restaurants reopened, they went back to, 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 to buying it out of the home. And you only buy a cello once. Um, yesterday, Scott McDonald from the ARF talked about the idea of using uh, online data, particularly search, as a way of understanding which quadrant you might be in, understanding what's going to happen to your sector. There will be winners and losers coming up. Use data, use things like search or share of search um, to understand whether you're in a growth sector or whether you're facing decline. And also understand how prices are going to play out in your sector. Inflation is rampant, but it's very different in different sectors. You know, we've, gas prices have doubled. Booze is actually quite cheap at the moment. Uh, consolations there. You can't put the heating on, but you can buy yourself a scotch. Um, um, understand where you fit within this sector. And it's not all about Ukraine. Some of the biggest increases are to do with the war. So um, 
obviously energy and also stuff like cooking oil, for example, which is to do with um, trade disruptions to Ukraine. But there are, but actually, inflation started to take off a year before Russia invaded Ukraine, um, and that's to do with mismatches between demand and supply. So understand how it plays out in your sector. Again, use data to help you. And remember that different social groups are behaving in quite different ways. We've seen an increase in inequality, and it's actually people at the lower end of the market, the, the poorer households, um, not actually the very poorest, but the ones one up from the, the second quarter who are really suffering, suffering. So how your brand will behave depends on whether you're at the, you're at the top end or the bottom end of the market. Um, OK, third factor, investment costs. Um, so recessions, we're not, as I say, we're not in recession at the moment, but recessions can actually be quite a cheap time to advertise. Um, so what tends to happen during recession is media prices tend to soften. In fact, they often tend to fall if we go into recession. Um, consumer spending also tends to fall, but not nearly as much. And if you think about it, the short-term ROI from advertising depends on that ratio of the value of your sector to the price of media. Um, so let's look at that value for money ra ratio for one medium. I'm going to look at TV because um, TV is a medium for which we have very good data over a very long period of time. So this is consumer spending divided by co consumer spending per head divided by the cost of reaching people, in cost per thousand, from 1965 up to date. Um, now, the first thing you see is actually that ratio has been rising over time. TV prices have not kept pace with consumer spending in the long run. So the ROI that you get from TV has been steadily rising over the decades, particularly since about 2000, due to increased competition. But look at what happens during recessions. So in the 70s, when we had an oil price shock, the value for money for TV went up. Um, the 1981 recession, the second oil, oil crisis and the, 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 if you like, the Thatcher recession, that was an exception. But the 90s recession saw the value for money go up. The 2001 crisis, which wasn't an official re recession in this country, saw value for money go up. The global financial crisis saw value go up. The COVID crisis saw, saw value go up. Now, how this plays out for you will depend on um, demand in your sector relative to TV prices. But if you're in a, in a sector that's doing relatively well, this can be a great time to buy share of voice. Um, a good example was Unilever saw this during the COVID crisis, saw that food and drink and FMCG stuff was going to be going gangbusters and piled heavily into TV. That's not going to be true for all of you, so you need to understand how it plays out in your sector. Um, now, all of those things actually kind of make things look quite good, but there is a big, big negative factor that, that, that's heading towards us. Inflation is actually good for advertising. The higher the rate of inflation, actually, the more the advertising investment makes sense. That might be counterintuitive, but believe me, the, the, the mathematics tell you that. Interest rates are the enemy. Interest rates mean that um, advertising investment or any kind of investment becomes less attractive. And interest rates have gone up. We've been in a period of very low interest rates, as I say, the lowest interest rates for 300 years in the UK, and they're, they're rising sharply. And again, I'm old enough to know how bad this can get. So this is interest rates since 1800, and as you see, in the 70s, when we last had rampant inflation, we got up to 17%. Uh, imagine what that will do to your mortgage. Um, the other factor is risk and volatility and uncertainty. Um, as Brand Finance pointed out yesterday, you pay a higher interest rate, there's an, a risk premium, the more that, that, that the investment is seen as, as uncertain and risky. And we're in a period of unprecedented uncertainty. This chart shows the divergence in different forecasters 
uh, economic forecasts. This is from uh, uh, one of the US uh, federal banks. Um, at the moment, forecasters just basically don't know what's going to happen. Um, now, strong brands can actually pay, are seen as less risky and can have a lower risk premium, as brand finance said yesterday. But the other thing you can do is, you, is reduce risk by more research. Um, if your advertising investment has a known result, then it's easier to justify expenditure, and it's easier to borrow money to do that. So measure financial payback, but measure it properly. Don't use attribution modeling. Um, attribution modeling is a useful way of comparing short-term efficiency, but it doesn't give you true ROI. Attribution modeling is probably the biggest single thing destroying our industry, actually, because it tells you completely the wrong numbers. Attribution modeling overestimates the effects of short-term direct activity by about a factor of two and underestimates uh, the effect of long-term brand building um, by a factor of 90%. Um, so use econometrics to measure payback and do it over not just the short term but the long term. You all know that Peter Field and I have been banging on for years about short term and long term effectiveness. Um, people say that econometrics can't measure the long term. They're wrong. Increasingly, econometric models are measuring the long term. Here's a real example for a real brand showing how we measured short and long term. Sorry, it wasn't me that did this. This is a great piece of work by D2D um, showing how the short and the long term effects can be measured. Um, and there's a new piece of research from the artist form, formerly known as Facebook, uh, Meta, um, looking at three and a half thousand campaigns and measuring short and long term effects. And what we find is that across all of those campaigns, only 40% of, of the effects are short term, 60% are long term. It's a 60 40 ratio, according to Facebook's new research. Um, so use econometrics to measure that stuff and then use it not to slash your budgets but to optimise them. Don't slash, tweak. Um, measure the diminishing returns. That's really, really important. All, all media have diminishing returns. Measure the net profit and optimise that net profit. Not ROI. Don't optimise ROI. Optimise net profit. The optimum ROI budget is always zero. If you optimise... ROI, you will destroy your business. In the current rising interest rate environment, it may be necessary to cut budgets a bit, but don't cut them too much. And if you can, maintain or even increase your share of voice by cutting less than your competitors. And then optimise the mix. This is where we get to the other 60-40 ratio. You need to measure the synergies between short and long term. And they can be measured with econometrics. They can also be measured with controlled tests. And I strongly recommend you to do both and to combine them. Um, this particular example, this is a real example of measuring that uh, brand activation curve for a real brand. And guess what? It comes out at 60-40. But different brands have different ratios. Measure yours and optimize yours. Uh, and don't go short term, too short term because you need brand building to support price in the inflationary environment. And the fifth factor is, is media efficiency, or rather efficiency overall. Um, understand then the efficiency of individual media. Work closely with your media agencies. This is what they do. Um, but make sure you measure not just short-term efficiency, but long-term efficiency. This comes from that research from Meta again, looking at ROI. Short-term efficiency tends to say, just do social media and, pay, uh, and paid search. Long-term efficiency tell, gives you a very different picture and shows actually that TV is in fact highly efficient and is in still much the most effective medium. So you need a combination of things like TV and online media. Um, and if you optimize that stuff, optimize media efficiency by geography, by product, by variant, by, by um, by timing, by, by media, you can increase your efficiency by, according to D2D, a factor of 12. So that can, you can make your budget go a lot further. But 
It's not just about the tweaking the equations. There's one other big thing, which Hegarty yesterday, I think, alluded to, um, and that's creativity. D, D to D's econometric research shows that creative is just as important as media, and our own research, Peterfield and I have shown that with outstanding creativity, you can make your, your, your budget go about 11 times further. So, to sum up, good research can help you through all this. It can reduce risk, risk and therefore help you through the, 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 the troubling times ahead. But do it properly. Don't rely on attribution modelling because it's flawed and it gives you the wrong answers. Combine attribution with econometrics and controlled tests. Understand the growth prospects and the price pressures in your sector. And I think search data can help you. And then focus first, not on advertising, but on prices and promotions. And use brand advertising to help you push through the price changes you need. Then optimise your advertising budgets. Don't slash them, tweak them, optimise them by geography, portfolio, channels, media. Maximise your net profit, not your ROI. ROI is a business-destroying metric if you focus on, on it too much. Look out for media bargains if you're one of the lucky ones that can exploit cheap media. If you do have to cut, try to maintain or increase your share of voice if you can, and don't go too short-term because you need brand to come out the other side. And above all, do all that mathematical stuff and harness the irrational, emotional power of creativity. Get a great agency on your side. Um, if you need a good one, there's one up in Paddington I can recommend. Thank you very much, and good luck.